Hello, and welcome to the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Well, we're coming to you from Austin, Texas, and we're here for South by Southwest at Dolby House. We have a great activation here at South by Southwest where we're showcasing some Dolby innovations and technology, not only in cinema and television, but also in music, gaming, automotive, and our web development platform, Dolby IO. Up here on our second floor creator space, we're hosting a lot of great conversations with people who are doing really interesting work. Today's conversation is on creative storytelling, how to make an indie film, with two filmmakers whose movies premiered at South by Southwest this year, Emma Westenberg and Hannah Pearl Utt. And the conversation is moderated by our good friend, producer Kennedy Davey. We are here today to talk about creative storytelling in the independent world, I think is our really, really long title. Um, and I have two fantastic filmmakers that I'm really excited to talk with today. We've got Hannah Pearl Utt, director of Corabora. I'm already blanking. Corabora uh, and ha Emma Westenberg, director of You Sing Loud, I Sing Louder. They both premiered in the last two days. Give them a massive round of applause. Um, I was talking with the ladies earlier and they were saying that this was the first opportunity they have to sort of like dive into the storytelling um, or to talk a little bit more in depth about their films. So what we really want to talk about today, I, I think a lot of people in this room or at least a lot of people that I know all come from filmmaking backgrounds. And so what we're hoping to sort of focus on today is how do you make an independent movie in this day and age, what does it take? Um, streamers, studios, you know, they're dominating with massive franchises and a lot of things that keep churning and making money in the background. And, um, and then here we are trying to tell really creative, engaging, beautiful stories, you know, slice of life, um, stories about these real people that aren't necessarily driven by mega, mega billions of dollars. So um, I want to read quickly, uh, if you haven't had a chance to see their films, they're fantastic, go, obviously. Um, but I want to read the log lines really quickly before we jump into it, just so everyone has a little bit of context before we start talking about it. So um, Hannah directed Cora Bora. Cora, who stars Megan Stalter, Meg, senses her open relationship is on the rocks when the strugg struggling musician and messy millennial goes home to Portland to win back her girlfriend. She realizes it's much more than her love life that needs salvaging. You Sing Loud, I Sing Louder stars a real life father and daughter Ewan McGregor and Clara McGregor. And in an effort to reunite with his daughter after a period of absence, a father takes her on a road trip to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And along the way, they encounter some interesting characters and obstacles while sorting out their relationship. Um, Emma, I wanna start with you. How did this project come to light um, and come to be? I know Clara is credited with a story by title. Um, how did you get involved in this project? It's actually Clara and Vera, her producing partner, who's here as well. They they started to uh, yeah work together to um, create movie stories, uh, and um, Clara had that this, had had this idea to make something uh, that is based off something that her father and her had went through a period of their life that was rocky and. Um, they had a screenwriter come in and write, uh, the, or they yeah worked on the story together and developed the script. And then um, Vera and I have known each other for a long time from Amsterdam. That's uh, where we were. That's where uh, we were from. Where from? And um, 
so this I read the script and then I basically pitched on it. It went to different uh, directors and I gave my take on how I would uh, redo the story and how I would tell it. So that's how I came aboard. And then um, when they they were on board on my take, they liked it. So Vera and Clara and uh, Killer Films was also attached. And then they said, okay, now the next round is to pitch it to you. And, and uh, uh, so I went on a Zoom because that was during COVID. And I pitched my take on it, like how I would change the narrative slightly um, and make different turns and... And then he was listening and then he said, oh, I don't like that at all. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, well, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I just turned beet red and in my head I was thinking I can't really back down now because this is the way that I would tell the story and I don't know how I would do it otherwise with conviction. So I just tried to um, uh, explain it to him in, from different ways and what options would happen if we would tell the story that way and then at some point he was like okay yeah maybe that is a good idea and then yeah I think maybe it was also a little bit of a test to see if I uh, would stick to my guns. I won't ask what you and didn't lo lo you know glom onto but how um, how far is the final picture from what you pitched I mean was it pretty much you know, I know as a director, things come up as you're in production, but did it stay pretty true to the, the, the vision that you had from the beginning? Yeah, definitely. We, um, yeah, the, I mean, so we did like uh, the rewrites and then um, the DP and I like went through every scene and really kind of f looked for the, you know, mobility and dynamics in every scene, not just on where the camera is, but just in general, the uh, dynamics of a scene uh, and really prepared everything so specifically. So it was, yeah, it's, I would say it's very close to what we intended it to be. Of course, there's always diff different things that come up, but it's very close, yeah. I was really fascinated to learn that you shot this in 22 days, which is a heroic feat. I know I'm not allowed to swear, I think, for the podcast, but, you know, that's, that's a big, big production. So how did, you, how did you plot that out? I mean, where, you know, it obviously takes place, it takes place on the road. We have a real family dynamic duo. Um, you know, what were your, like, production logistics going into it? How did you sort of map it out? It was definitely this thing of once we had the schedule, like all the scenes that we had to film, and then when we had the schedule, I was very much like, okay, <laughs> I don't know how that is gonna work out, you know, with ex exactly like driving and a lot of driving scenes, of course, and those are just technically pretty, just they take a minute. So it was definitely a, a big mountain, but then, I don't know, we just took it one, uh, a scene at a time and uh, everybody uh, that was involved uh, in making it was really knew you know the, the time that we had and really was just collaborative in making it happen it's um, I think that is the the nice thing about making an indie movie or something small is that you get so close to each other and everybody who's in, who is involved is doing it because they believe in the project and not because they're making a bunch of money. So it really creates this, yeah, really special group dynamic where everybody just puts in, you know, 100 and, or 200 percent of what they can do. And it's really, in, yeah, incredible in that way. So it's because of the, the crew that we made it happen, really. Yeah. And the cast, of course. Yeah. It was talked about, and I love that it was talked about all night at the Oscars last night, but like, you know, the crew, your key collaborators are really what like helps bring it all together when you're in the trenches. Um, Hannah, you also shot in 18 days in two cities, Los Angeles and Portland. How, first of all, how did Portland become, like, it's such a, it's such a character of your film. Like the cities really 
show up as characters in your movie and are, are so pivotal, pivotal to Cora's, you know, both physical location, but, you know, where she's at in her life. How did, how was, was Portland scripted from the beginning? And how did you sort of deal with both cities, production in both cities? Um, yes, Portland was part of, always part of the script, which I didn't write. Um, Rhiannon Jones wrote the script and, um, I liked how sp- Brianna lived in Portland for a long time and you could tell she had a really specific relationship to that place and the music scene in that place. And um, she had, she just had a really great take on like hometown melancholy that I related to. Um, that e- even when you're coming home to a beautiful place full of people who are... Um, I guess some of them welcome her, a lot of them don't. Um, But I felt like the script captured um, that anxiety and how claustrophobic it can feel. And so that was how I tried to approach Portland. Um, You know, I talked with my DP about the difference in... Because she also feels very alone and... um, sort of claustrophobic in LA, but it's a really different thing. I wanted like the brightness and the expansiveness to be the thing that was oppressive in LA and in Portland, more like the gloom and the, almost the coziness. Um, and then when it came to shooting in both places, LA was, for the amount of time that we had and the, our very limited budget, LA was practical just because it's easy to get actors to pop in for a day. Um, and we had a lot of, a lot of characters. Um, it was easier to get good crew. LA is expensive because there aren't really tax credits. And one of the <coughs> challenges. <laughs> <clears throat> if anyone has any sway in this yeah, room. Honestly. Um, but people could kind of like, we, we just got a really high level of talent for our department heads and our crew because they were able to slot it in between jobs and they could go home to their families at the end of the day. And so that became worth the cost. Um, and then we did a skeleton crew in Portland and there were a couple days that were just me and um, Sophia, one of our associate producers and my childhood best friend, um, running around with a camera and my cousins begging people to sign releases. <laughs> um, so it was very, very scrappy, um, which is fun. Every, you, know, you know why everyone's doing it. Um, there's no reason not to give your best because you're like, what are you here for? <laughs> it's Definitely not the money. (laughs) Emma, you also had, uh, you know, outside of two very visible people, um, the father and the daughter, you had what seemed to be a lot of, like, local talent. Um, There's this beautiful scene in in sort of a trailer park or at someone's home, which, you know, is a smaller house on a big plot of land. Um, And those family seemed really like genuine the the people almost seemed like authentic and real and maybe just found at a local restaurant how did you go about casting in santa fe right um yeah we were in and around albuquerque we had a really uh, wonderful casting director um angelique mitthunder and she yeah we had a we had a lot of people um because vera one of the producers she's also starring in it and then her wonderful husband Jake is also starring in it um, and then his mother actually Kim Zimmer is the tow truck driver is also starring in it so it was very much a family affair and then we added to that uh, local um, actors and performers uh, that Angelique had helped us find and yeah we talked a lot about anyway how in the movie um, we wanted to create this atmosphere of uh, yeah, I really uh, love the absurdity of reality. So we talked a lot about that, you know, the, about how um, when you take a trip through uh, any country, you just meet the most colorful, wonderful, interesting people. 
people. And we really wanted to show that in the trip, that there was all these different uh, char characteristic uh, people. Yeah. There, I was reading this morning uh, a review of the uh, new film put out by Robert Rodriguez, which premiered here at South by Southwest, and it stars Ben Affleck, and he was saying how in COVID it started as a 56-day shoot, and then as a result of COVID, it was whittled down and whittled down to 34 days, and they did French hours, and he called Ben and said something like, hey, are you up for this? And Ben said, uh, feels like the good old 90s and like nobody does run and gun guerrilla style anymore. And I thought like, that's the, that's the disconnect between this like independent filmmaking and, you know, and sort of like where people in their careers kind of get to. So how, how I don't, I don't want to ask you the, uh, what were your challenges? But, you know, how were you able to stretch the dollar? How were you able to make it work? I mean, they always say, what is it? You can have it good, fast, and cheap. It's like, how do you get all three, you know? You have to have people who really love the material and are willing to work at, like, the very bottom end of their rate. Um, and you have to be willing to stomach that um, <laughs> as the person hiring them, asking them to do it. Um, my producer, like, moved mountains for us. Mallory Schwartz is kind of my key collaborator. And I don't... She's just, like, really... She... Uh, she's just really good at, like, getting favors. Finagling. Yeah. She kind of... She's a boss, but then can play this little sister card. And, like, I don't know how she does it, but um, we... It was, it was that film school thing of just, like, getting favors um and then grouping locations was huge um and there were certain compromises that had to be made on locations just because it was like either um yeah it was either we write them out or or you figure out how to make this bar play for two bars you know just like flexibility um and good relationships, like in-kind stuff. We got a great deal for our post. Yeah, I, I mean, I do really think that it's all about being able to rely on uh, your cost and crew and how, how yes, you know, sometimes because I do commercials uh, as well or like TV and then you also meet people and you make... I don't know, and, and through school and through other ways, you find your kind of the people that you like to work with. And I think then sometimes you do something together that is really a pet more for, you know, the passion and the love for filmmaking. And sometimes you do something because you also need to pay the rent. I, mean, I love it because sometimes I, yeah, I, I'm the subtext is where I'm like, oh, I get it. I get it. Um, you both have had, you know, quite extensive careers before coming into feature films. I mean, well, you have a lot of credits. You have a lot of credits. Hannah was, a, was an actor. Did I get that right? You were acting for uh, a while. Yeah, bef before I was directing. Um, how did you get into directing? What sort of drew you into it? And how, uh, this is sort of a question for both of you, but like, you know, how... Um, what was appealing about it? What sort of led you in? We were talking about this the other day. We both came at it from different places. We had things we were really passionate about and then we're like, what's that might actually be the thing. Yeah, I mean, I uh, went to an art school because I was always drawing and making things and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that I liked to make stuff and then I... Uh, uh, in art school started to make a lot of videos because I'm really interested in people. I just, uh, my parents are both psychologists, so maybe that explains, I just love to watch people always. So video was a very good thing to do that because you just do a frame around somebody. Um, and then in art, I had a very kind of love-hate relationship with the art world, um, 
and then I started to intern for a production company in Amsterdam and I realized that the film world was more uh, for me because I really love the collaborative aspect of it and, and um, that it's really hands-on and once it's done, the project, then uh, it, it, you know, it lives by itself. Um, so then I started to work as a production assistant, as a production manager, doing editing, um, yeah, uh, you know, doing all kinds of different work within film while then making my own uh, portfolio just with friends doing n no budget videos. Um, and so doing that at the same time and not sleeping for or having a personal life for all of my 20s and now here I am. <laughs> I, yes, I came at it through acting. I acted uh, my whole life. I loved theater. Um, and then in, it was college. It was after my freshman year of college that I, um, I realized I was more interested in storytelling than acting specifically. And so I studied a bunch of different things, uh, always with kind of the focus of narrative and um, how it's used in like creating belief systems and community. And then I had all these talented friends who we were all broke and not doing what we wanted to be doing. And um, I'm a pretty good host. So I employed my dinner party skills um, and, and just wrangled, wrangled as many of my talented friends as I could to make anything that we could. Um, and then threw a lot of dinner parties to raise money for those things. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of stuck with my key collaborators and, and grew up with them. And things got a little bigger and a little bigger. I feel like in both of your, in, in sort of both of your experiences, it lends itself to um, being able to kind of dive into your characters and really like understand what they're going through and the arc and the trajectory that they're taking. Um, can you tell me, you know, sort of you with your psychology, your parents and psychology and like you as an actor, can you, can you tell me a little bit about how you work to sort of pull that out of your people on set and your sort of lead talent? The reason why we love movies is because it's you connect to something, right? You see somebody go through something and you connect through it. And I feel, I think, as a director, more than anything, you're making sure that people connect to the material and connect to the story in their own way, and that they bring to that, uh, to the either to the part or to behind the camera yeah their own uh, possibilities and wisdom and stuff like that so really yeah trying to find connection I think yeah it's the same I usually ask a ton of questions um starting with the actors I'll it's basically like homework I didn't like doing for myself as an actor so I'll do it with them <laughs> and then it really helps me um, because we wind up having a shared understanding of the character's history and there's these little like um, uh, like shortcuts I can use on set. Uh, so it'll be like, you know, what, uh, did this person have a best friend growing up? When was the first time they were mortified? Um, closer to mother or father? And we just gather as much information as possible. And then through that, there's story, there's personal story, so they can kind of find their own connection. Um, and then when we're on set, I can kind of tap into it, be like, remember that really mortifying experience you had? Let's, let's try it, you know, from that place. Um, and then I like to use that information with all of the department heads, and we do the same thing of like, you know, who gave her this necklace? Um, is she still in touch with them? And just try to, like, so that every, everything feels specific and special. And then I feel like everyone gets to um, put their stamp on it. It's almost like walking into production or pre-production with your 
you know, your key collaborators with like a questionnaire, like how does she take her coffee? How do you, what do you eat for lunch? Or what does Cora eat for lunch? Um, I, was, uh, I was really interested to learn that, uh, you know, Cora, Meg does such a phenomenal job as Cora and like holds, you know, holds this beautiful presence all throughout the film. Um, and I was really surprised to learn that she wasn't, that it wasn't written for her, that this wasn't like a part that was considered for Meg. How, for those who don't know, Megan Stalter is an amazing comedian and, um, and I think got really popular through Twitter and TikTok, like doing Instagram, like doing like funny videos. She's now on the show Hacks, which she plays this, really funny, zany part on Hacks. Um, how did you guys find, how did you find Meg? How did she come to be a part of this project? Because it feels so good. Thank you, I'm glad, I'm glad it feels that way for you too. Um, the, I was so in love with the character when I read the script. Um, she reminded me so much of a couple of my favorite, most perplexing friends who I felt like I'd never seen represented on screen. Um, and I sent the script to Mallory, um, and she was like, I'm sorry, why do you like this person? Because <laughs> she's a really, she's a very difficult character. Um, and I was like, well, she's, you know, she's someone who's, uh, she's carrying around this thing that is dead um, that she can't let go of. Because um, at that point, it was about her relationship um, being over and her kind of not being able to process that and very funny. And then when we dug in with Rianne and we found, I was like, I don't know. I just feel like there's something else here. Like I'm, I'm picking up on a real heaviness with this character. And we wound up finding this very personal relationship that Rianne had, um, to Portland and why she left Portland that it turned out was already in the script. It just hadn't, we just kind of had to like reframe some of the subtext and um, get it more in the story. And Megan was so right for the, the first version that I read. And then when I started watching more of her work, I realized that I think, I think the reason like everyone can relate to her characters, even though they are so nightmarish, is that she has a really high EQ and she is so empathetic. Um, and that was, that was kind of the, the click where it was like, oh, we haven't gotten to see her tap into this well of vulnerability and empathy um, that she's clearly capable of. And then she was the first actor we went out to and it was just like a, a perfect fit. And from the first meeting, I was really, because sometimes when you meet comedians, you know, you don't know if they're going to be really on or um, excited about the dramatic challenges. And she was just like so ready for it. Did you find her? Did someone, did you, were you working with a casting director who put her forward? Did you Weirdly, stumble? it was like on the same day, Tristan, who sent me the script, who was our co-producer, Rhiannon, who wrote the script, and Mallory, we were on a text chain and like all on the same day, we're like, oh my God, it's Megan Stalter. And Mal knew a casting director who had a relationship with her, so we sent her the deck and a letter and so it was organic. Emma, you, you and McGregor and Clara are obviously like, I mean, on, you know, on screen, they're, they're the famili familiarity that they have with one another obviously comes through and they're so, they really drive home the intimacy and um, there is such a, I mean, there's such a beauty in even just your profile shots watching sort of Clara's face, you know, <clears throat> next to Ewan's face and, and seeing the family resemblance. What was it like working with them in, in this scope, which is like, this is sort of semi-autobiographical. There are some things there that they're needing to tap into. What was it like working with them and, you know, sort of 
going there? Yeah, it was really special to witness and to be part of that relationship for a little bit. I think, um, you know, everybody has a relationship with a parent and, and there's just no... It's so complicated and so years long that you, you can't just uh, uh, copy that. And I think just having the two of them now, you know, reconciled um, uh, and sometimes stepping into these things that were painful for them was just really beautiful to witness and, and also very healing for them, but also for, you know, the crew and the cast that were there and, and, and would have had similar experiences or um, have gone through some kind of, you know, of, uh, break up with your family and then reconciliation. So it was really wonderful to be able to work with that. There was this one really beautiful moment in a the movie. They have a big fight, right? And um, uh, we were doing the scene on different... It's a really intense scene and it's really kind of painful. And we were doing it in different ways and constantly trying to get out the knots out, you know, trying to... Okay, like, this doesn't work. Maybe we try this. And, it, and then at some point he was... he he We did it the scene again and then he said you can be really you know you can really be really mad at me and then we did it again and then she really let go so because he l allowed her to you know go in into these emotions uh i think we got this beautiful take that is in the movie so um i think that yeah, we, we you know we in in our, in our movies and stories and stuff. I think we tr we try to tell emotions in a very pure way and a, a real way because I think as a viewer you can recognize what is real and what is true, even if it's not real or true. Because we're obviously making a movie, but I think we're all trying to tap into certain emotions and certain experiences that you then translate into a story. Um, and uh, yeah, having their real life relationship and their real life dynamics only added to that, yeah. You and obviously has this like extensive career was, and I, I know Clara's been, you know, modeling and doing some acting, but obviously she's younger and there's less of a career behind her. Were there any moments, any other moments like that where Ewan was sort of like, come on, you know, g coaching or helping her to, draw something out no he, uh, mostly he was just uh, in awe of her it was very sweet he was very proud and uh, uh, um, just I would hear him you know when we I would have my headphones and I would be on the other car and they would be in the in the picture car um, after a take uh, sometimes I would just hear him say like that was really great or I'm really proud of you yeah it was very sweet so no not so much <laughs> it was just that moment where he I think it was also because that is a very painful scene and very personal and that he, it was something that they were doing together that he was just like, you can go there, go ahead. Yeah. You both use, you know, your cinematographers brought so much richness and realness to it and like, woohoo, you know, DPs, they're making Mine amazing. Mine is right there. Woohoo. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, and, you know, and the location for both of you it plays so heavily, and the cinematography plays so heavily into your story. Um, Emma, how did you, you had, you know, I'm thinking about that scene where you have what I'm assuming is a camera on, on a swivel or on a hat, and it's just like panning. The, and the, the, the camera is, is stationed in the car a lot. How, you know, what was that like? Are you in a follow van? Are they driving? Or are they sometimes on a trailer? Like what was, you had a lot of, that's some hard parameters. Yeah, we had a lot of, we, we did different, we, were, we did a lot of normal driving and then we had some process trailer um, and some just in, when it was dark in the parking lot, moving the car around while it was static. Um, one scene where we were switching the camera in between them, we were driving and then Ewan kind of forgot because, it, it, because we were also sometimes on a process trailer and it was dark out and he was we almost and we just did it like quickly in between, you know, somewhere. Um, uh, so, uh, 
yeah, it, that, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this on camera. <laughs> yeah, like, don't say too much. Don't no. give all the tricks away, but it was interesting to watch. Yeah. And of course, me as a producer is like, how did they do that? How did they do that? What yeah, was well, that Yoon like? is a great driver, so that was, uh, that, that's how we did it. <laughs> no, um, no accidents, no roadkill, no, you know, everything was safe. Um, Hannah, you had a lot of location changes. <laughs> I mean, not just like LA and Portland, but you know, you had a lot of scenes in a lot of different places where your days, you know, sl- something's happening fun. I don't know. Um, there's some kind of protest or something. Um, were, you, were you doing a lot of company moves? Were you, I mean, I'm sure, you know. Yeah, that was, that was one of the biggest challenges. Uh, figuring out how to pull off that many locations with the amount of days we had. Um, luckily, I have an incredible locations uh, manager. If anyone needs somebody, her name is, um, oh my God, what's Lauren's last name? Taylor. Her name is Lauren, Lauren Taylor. Taylor. Location scout. The infant is eating my brain cells. <laughs> um, she's so, so good. Um, but yeah, it was, it was grouping locations. And uh, yeah, that's all. really all I have to say. It was very hard. <laughs> yeah. And we could have, like, we, th- we could have tried to cut more of them. Um, but I liked how kind of expansive the Odyssey was, um, at least like geographically. So we we stuck with it. In my viewing and, you know, trying to understand from a producer point of view how you would be doing this, you're, you're like literally driving from location to location, you know, in your case, Emma, from like maybe hotel to hotel and you're just like, let's shoot while we're driving. It It really felt like you were... There was, um, what am I having a flashback? There was a scene where I feel like there was a little get, like um, someone was cheering and clapping and there was like a little, it felt like just what you said, like your family is out there just trying to get location really, or, you know, on camera releases. Um, Because we're here today to talk about like independent film, I know we talk heavily about key collaborators. How do you find these people? I mean, they're, I think we sort of touched on it. It's like people you went to school with, people you just gel with. Are these now people in your trusted inner circle for life? Well, for instance, Vera, one of the producers, I um, met her through Instagram because I was uh, casting one of my very first music videos back in Amsterdam. And she started it. And, you know, I think that was... And then we just really got along and understood each other's, you know, humor and way of speaking. And I think it's, it is so much. This is always when film students or something are asking, like, how do I become a director? I cannot stress enough that it's always like finding your yeah, collaborators and out of genuine interest for what they do, for what they, you know, if they're like the... the um, stylist of the movie, wardrobe uh, uh, designers. Um, I s- wa- saw, we went to the same art school and I saw her graduation um, ca- uh, show with all the models walking down the... And I just got genuinely so excited that I was like, I need to make something with her, you know? That, and I think that feeling, and the same with Stefanik, our production designer who's here, that I just... Yeah, just a genuine love for each other's work, I think. And then um, if you bring that together, that then something new uh, comes to life that is, uh, yeah, really special. And uh, yeah, definitely also f- yeah, uh, brings a depth to a friendship that's really special. And I think that that is what you should be looking for. Yeah, what makes the work meaningful as well, yeah. I mean, it definitely makes like 22 and 18 days together nonstop, like worthwhile and, you know, and yeah, enjoyable. Yeah, not like a total nightmare. Actually pretty fun to go to work. Yeah. Um, at the risk of asking something super redundant, what is next? What happens? What you got going? Well, Mallory and I have a movie that we were working on before Cora came into our lives um, that is 
much bigger, um, but still like a relationship based. It's a queer rom com about two. Uh, female composers nominated for the same Oscar for score who fall in love. <laughs> you know, that old chestnut. Um, so that's that's like a, a more ambitious, I think, like long, longer um, project. And then I have a, a movie I'm hoping to make right after I am capable after giving birth. It's kind of like a, um, paranoid meltdown about motherhood that all takes place during a 10 year old's birthday party. That seems like it'll, the timing will be really good for me. <laughs> it'll be fresh. <laughs> Emma, what do you? I really would love to do a genre piece after this because it's a drama, dramedy, and I would love to either make a dance movie or an alien movie, and both are in the works, so we'll see which one goes first. <laughs> and also to anyone here who maybe wants to jump in on that. Yes, 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 yeah. we're yeah. Looking, yeah, yeah. looking for $10 million. A dance movie. <laughs> higher, higher. Oh, oh yeah. More, $20 more. million. Dollars. <laughs> I also want to direct TV. I can totally do it for 10, though. Yeah, yeah. Hiring for TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 10 million is just your fee. Come on. And Hannah wants TV. If anyone want, you know, needs Hannah for that. Or yeah, wants give Hannah me, for that. I'll, take, I'll take all your TV. <laughs> I feel like everyone's peddling at South By. Everyone's hustling. So, like, we got to hustle, too. Um, uh, I think we're going to turn it over to questions from the audience, and we will have a microphone coming around. So, anyone want to ask these lovely folks some things? I have a question for both of you. Actually, there's two or three. It's a two or three part question. Um, did you film using film or digital? Um, that would be the first one. You can either you can do you can answer them or digital. Do yeah, same digital. Digital, okay. Yeah, and that was a sure a conscious choice because used to be not. Okay, and then secondly, what was your time frame in your pre-production, post-production, uh, production, and post-production, and what was your total budget? Those were the other two questions. Total time frame, pre-production, production, post-production, post and your budget. The time frame, I think. Like it was, we were basically figuring out still the budget while we were starting pre-production because we were like, if we don't start it now, then, so we were kind of uh, um, started pre-production. Maybe we had the money sealed. How, mu how long was it from Van Tevoren? Like three weeks before the shoots, we had the actual money, so, but we were already had been working on it for, you know, in pre-production really for like two months or something um, and then we filmed for 22 days and then I think post was uh, about yeah half a year or something but often and, off and on and the total budget I think in the end oh I can't sell can't say oh can't say a range under under 20 yes yeah, so I was under 20 <laughs> So the next one needs to be you know over 20 how much time for prep I think we had uh, like hard prep started a month out we I had um we lost our DP a week into prep so I only had three weeks to work with the DP I wound up working with I'm so glad that that happened because she w wound up being perfect for it and um I don't know how we would have pulled it off without her um the post we had a 12-week schedule and I think we got a little extra time in the sound mix because it was a friends and family deal and they were kind of figuring out when to slot us in. Um, and yeah, I can't, uh, we don't get to talk about the budget, not until we sell the movie. <laughs> no, no. But it was very low, I'll tell you. I mean, sh I'm not even allowed to say that. Uh, it was high. It was. <laughs> so the next one needs to be higher. Yeah. Who, um, who set the 12 week post schedule? Was that locked in because of your budget constraints or were you trying to hit a deadline? That's what we did on my first movie. Um, and I think it's pretty standard. Um, and we were trying to hit festival deadlines yeah. and like I, I could edit for years and my producer knows that. So she also knows that I can finish a movie in 12 weeks. 
Damn, girl, you're fast. Is that fat? I don't know. She's I mean, convinced me that's like luxurious. Should I be? I mean, that's that's great. That's great. Go I think to the DJ tells you you can have ten weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, so you sort of answered this, but I'd like a couple more details. Both of you said you're trying to sell the movie. So you made it without having a distribution deal. And was that a little, did that affect the production at all, knowing that you didn't have one? And who, you, I know you can't say who you've been talking to, but since the premiere, has that caused a lot more interest in distribution? We got an independent uh, financier and they finance independent movies um, and then they try to sell it at a festival. So yeah, that, that is uh, what they're trying to <laughs> do right now or doing right now, not trying. It's going great. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's what I know so far is getting a movie financed independently. Um, and then they're, they're taking a risk. Um, but it's a calculated risk and when it, when it pays off, it really pays off for them. Um, and I think it gives you more creative freedom. I, um, obviously when I get the perfect distributor, who's just the best creative partner, I won't feel that way, but, um, yeah, I think that's just kind of, that was the way we were able to make this movie. But I think you're I think you're touching on something so great, and that was a great question too, that you know I was a little afraid to ask myself. But um, that's independent filmmaking today. You know, you you aren't setting out to necessarily reap benefits. You're setting out to make a movie that you want to make. You're hoping for the best, which is to sell it. You know, we all maybe watched the Oscars last night. We watched last year's Darling. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. You know, when, when big, 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 it was the premiered at tw South by last year. So, you know, this is sort of the trajectory right now for independent filmmaking. And what's great, you know, yes, it is a risk from a budget point of view, of view but what's great is that you get full autonomy on making the movie that you want to make. So no one's going to say, oh, you can't talk about periods because we don't, we're a G-rated company. You know, you aren't, you aren't censored in any way. You get to sort of make what you want to make, so. Yeah, it's an interesting time for festivals. It feels like there's, maybe this isn't true, but it feels like there are more movies at festivals that already have distribution, um, which I guess is great for the ones that don't. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not sure what's up with the independent filmmaking market right now? Seems a little scary. <laughs> it's like, I saw a friend yesterday who was like, who's pregnant with her second child and was talking about her first and she was like, God, my first, he loves the band. He just like, he won't get away from the music. And she was like, be an engineer, you know, like don't go into this. Her husband's a musician. She was like, D I wouldn't choose this for them. But like, here we are, we love it. I just wonder how much of your time and energy do you have to spend getting your initial money? I mean, it's, that's something you have to do, right? Find the, find the money? Yes, that's my mother. <laughs> She's looking out for me. Be an engineer. Be an, uh, <laughs> yes, that's a huge part of being an, uh, at least my experience of being an indie director. I think even when you have like a, a fancy producer production company, you're still just peddling your wares. You have to like, you're pitching. Um, you're pitching a movie you haven't made yet. You're pitching them on um, why they should invest, in how it's gonna make them money. Um, and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I have no idea. Um, and then most importantly, pitching them on how rewarding it will be even if it doesn't make money. You know, it's like you really have to um, get your financiers on board as true collaborators, I think, if you don't want to just be constantly coming up against barriers in your creative choices. And we found that in LAMF. Our, they're really wonderful, and Neon Heart, um, the two companies. But, yeah, it's a, it's a ton of that. 
just not for free filmmaking. <laughs> I mean, you can do it for very little money, but yeah. I mean, you have to love it. You have to love it and love what you're doing. That's the, the producers do a lot of that too. And your sales agents and, but. Hi, so considering your uh, schedule was 22 and 18 days, um, how much did that, I, I'm, I'm sure it dictated a lot the style choices you had to make and longer takes and how many takes you got to do, but uh, how early in the process did you start doing that? Did you sort of like know your schedule and base the creative off of the schedule or did you kind of have the creative end of it and then uh, make considerations for what your schedule ended up being? That's such a good question. Um, I started with my like dream um, my crane shots that I knew I would never get. And then it was just kind of a process of like finding um, the thing that could ac accomplish the same thing emotionally, but um, in a cheaper way. <laughs> um, and then I think the nice thing about being on a really tight schedule is you have to be really economical with what you shoot. And so in some ways you're capturing like live theater. Um, and I think that can be really like magical. Um, and it gives it a, a, an extra sparkle that you don't always have when you ha actually have enough time. No, I agree. I think I always love watching movies from my favorite filmmakers that they did when they didn't have any money, because I think that's when you see choices very clearly and it's, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's a different. Of course, it's also great if you can make choices with a lot of money, but it does bring out, yes, yeah, a special kind of creativity and just a different atmosphere, which is, which is really, yeah, I loved it. I would do it again tomorrow, yeah, or every day, I don't know. I think that's it for today. Um, thank you again for everyone to co for coming. Thank you again, Hannah and Emma. Thank you, Dolby. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dolby. And enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks once again to Kennedy, Emma, and Hannah for that great conversation. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon, and our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thanks for listening.